prayer essential to God. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speak vanity. Isaiah 58, 9. Isaiah 58, 14. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. It must never be forgotten that Almighty God rules this world. He is not an absentee God. His hand is ever on the throttle of human affairs. He is everywhere, present in the concerns of time. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. He rules the world just as he rules the church by prayer. This lesson needs to be emphasized, iterated and reiterated in the ears of men of modern times and brought to bear with cumulative force on the consciences of this generation whose eyes have no vision for the eternal things, whose ears are deaf toward God. Nothing is more important to God than prayer in dealing with mankind. But it is likewise all important to man to pray. Failure to pray is failure along the whole line of life. It is failure of duty, of service and spiritual progress. God must help man by prayer. He who does not pray, therefore, robs himself of God's help and places God where he cannot help man. Man must pray to God if love for God is to exist. Faith and hope aid patience and all the strong, beautiful, vital forces of piety are withered and dead in a prayerless life. The life of the individual believer, his personal salvation and personal Christian graces have their being, bloom, and fruitage in prayer. All this and much more can be said as to the necessity of prayer to the being and culture of piety in the individual. But prayer has a larger sphere, a more obligated duty, a loftier inspiration. Prayer concerns God, whose purposes and plans are conditioned on prayer. His will and his glory are bound up in praying. The days of God's splendor and renown have always been the great days of prayer. God's great movements in this world have been conditioned on, continued and fashioned by prayer. God has put himself in these great movements just as men have prayed. Present prevailing, conspicuous and mastering prayer has always brought God to be present. The real and obvious test of a genuine work of God is the prevalence of the spirit of prayer. God's mightiest forces surcharge and impregnate a movement when prayer's mightiest forces are there. God's movement to bring Israel from Egyptian bondage had its inception in prayer. Thus early did God and the human race put the fact of prayer as one of the granite forces upon which his world movements were to be based. Hannah's petition for a son began a great prayer movement for God in Israel. Praying women whose prayers like those of Hannah can give to the cause of God men like Samuel do more for the church and the world than all the politicians on earth. Men born of prayer are the saviors of the state and men saturated with prayer give life and impetus to the church. Under God, they are saviors and helpers of both church and state. We must believe that the divine record of the facts about prayer and God are given in order that we might be constantly reminded of him 
and be ever refreshed by the faith that God holds his church for the entire world and that God's purpose will be fulfilled. His plans concerning the church will most assuredly and inevitably be carried out. That record of God has been given without doubt that we may be deeply impressed that the prayers of God's saints are a great factor, a supreme factor in carrying forward God's work with facility and in time. When the church is in the condition of prayer, God's cause always flourishes and his kingdom on earth always triumphs. When the church fails to pray, God's cause decays and evil of every kind prevails. In other words, God works through the prayers of his people and when they fail him, at this point, decline and deadness ensue. It is according to the divine plans that spiritual prosperity comes through the prayer channel. Praying saints are God's agents for carrying on his saving and providential work on earth. If his agents fail him, neglecting to pray, then his work fails. Praying agents of the Most High are always forerunners of spiritual prosperity. The men of the church of all ages who have held the church for God have had in affluent fullness and richness the ministry of prayer. The rulers of the church, which the scriptures reveal, have had preeminence in prayer. Eminent they may have been in culture, in intellect, and in all the natural or human forces, or they may have been lowly in physical attainments and native gifts. Yet in each case, prayer was the all potent force in the rulership of the church. And this was so because God was with and in what they did. For prayer always carries us back to God. It recognizes God and brings God into the world to work and to save and bless. The most efficient agents in disseminating the knowledge of God, in prosecuting his work upon the earth, and in standing as break water against the billows of evil have been praying church leaders. God depends upon them, employs them and blesses them. Prayer cannot be retired as a secondary force in this world. To do so is to retire God from the movement. It is to make God secondary. The prayer ministry is an all engaging force. It must be so to be a force at all. Prayer is the sense of God's need and the call for God's help to supply that need. The estimate and place of prayer is the estimate and place of God. To give prayer the secondary place is to make God secondary in life's affairs. To substitute other forces for prayer retires God and materializes the whole movement. Prayer is an absolute necessity to the proper carrying on of God's work. God has made it so. This must have been the principal reason why in the early church, when the complaint that the widows of certain believers had been neglected in the daily administration of the church's benefactions, that the 12 called the disciples together and told them to look out for seven men full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom who they would appoint over that benevolent work, adding this important statement. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They surely realized that the success of the word and the progress of the church were dependent in a preeminent sense upon their giving themselves to prayer. God could effectively work through them in proportion as they gave themselves fully to prayer. The apostles were as dependent upon prayer as other folks. Sacred work, church activities may so engage and absorb us as to hinder praying. And when this is the case, evil results always follow. It is better to let the work go by default than to let the praying go by neglect. Whatever affects the intensity of our praying affects the value of our work. Too busy to pray is not only the keynote to backsliding, but it mars even the work done. 
Nothing is well done without prayer for the simple reason that it leaves God out of the account. It is so easy to be seduced by the good to the neglect of the best until both the good and the best perish. How easily may men, even leaders in Zion, be led by the insidious wiles of Satan to cut short our praying in the interests of the work. How easy to neglect prayer or abbreviate our praying simply by the plea that we have church work on our hands. Satan has effectively disarmed us when he can keep us too busy doing things to stop and pray. Give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. The revised version has it, we will continue steadfastly in prayer. The implication of the word used here means to be strong, steadfast, devoted to, to keep at it with constant care, to make a business out of it. We find the same word in Colossians 4.12 and in Romans 12.12, which is translated continuing instant in prayer. The apostles were under the law of prayer which law recognises God as God and depends upon him to do for them what he would not do without prayer. They were under the necessity of prayer, just as all believers are, in every age and in every clime. They had to be devoted to prayer in order to make their ministry of the word efficient. The business of preaching is worth very little without it be in direct partnership with the business of prayer. Apostolic preaching cannot be carried on unless there is apostolic praying. Alas, that this plain truth has been so easily forgotten by those who minister in holy things. Without in any way passing criticism, we feel it to be high time that somebody or other declared to its members that effective preaching is conditioned on effective praying. The preaching which is most successful is that ministry which has much of prayer in it. Perhaps one might go as far as to say that it is the only kind that is successful. Just as in this day we find in many places laymen and ministers are so busily engaged in serving tables that they are glaringly deficient in praying. In fact, in present day church affairs, men are looked upon as religious because they give largely of their money to the church. And men are chosen for official positions, not because they are men of prayer, but because they have the financial ability to run church finances and to get money for the church. Now, these apostles, when they looked into this matter, determined to put aside these hindrances growing out of church finances and resolved to give themselves to prayer. Not that these finances were to be ignored or set aside, but ordinary laymen full of faith and the Holy Ghost could be found really religious men who could easily attend to this money business without in the least affecting their piety or prayer, thus giving them something to do in the church and at the same time taking the burden from the apostles who'd, who would now be able to pray more and praying more to be blessed themselves in soul and at the same time to more effectually do the work to which they had been called. <laughs>